was it? It was an absolute cold and the pressure on both teams was, was immense. I thought my heart was going to come through my jersey that day. This is probably the, the most important game in, in, in the history of this club. They were paranoid against us. They were paranoid, they, they didn't know how to beat us. We were under a great deal of pressure there, um, and we were, you know, under the cosh for, for long, long spells. It was incredible. I mean, your hairs are standing up, and the atmosphere is electric. This is the story of the Rangers team and their remarkable attempt in 1997 to win nine league titles in a row. In March of that year, after eight championship winning seasons, Rangers were within touching distance of Scottish football's holy grail. Standing in their way were their greatest rival, Celtic, determined more than ever that day to stop them reaching it. With only six games left of the season, their task was simple. Beat Celtic now and take a final step to becoming legends, or lose and risk going down in history as football's nearly men. It was to be an explosive match. It was a game that we went into and we knew if it went obviously Celtic's way then we were under serious pressure. Um, the points would have went from 14 to 2 um, and it would have heaped, if it could heap any more pressure on top of us. And the signs that day were not good for Rangers. Eight tough campaigns had taken their toll on their ageing squad. Not only that, but they were forced to play a third-choice goalkeeper signed earlier that month on a free transfer. Manager Walter Smith had another decision to make. Captain Richard Goff looked like he'd just returned from the wars. And talking of ancient warriors, would it be folly or genius to bring back on for one last throw of the dice an ageing striker known affectionately as Attila? Injured superstar Paul Gascoigne was also unavailable. The week before, he had moved from the sports pages to the front pages. It wasn't the first, and it certainly wouldn't be the last time he'd be there. That was the game. That was the, the realisation that, uh, you know, if Rangers won it effectively, it looked as though it was going to be nine in a row. It was Celtic's probably last through the dice. Rangers began their title-winning run back in 1989. The soonest revolution had arrived, and a wind of change swept through the Ibrox boardroom. Along with a dodgy perm came three league titles in a row. Exit Soonis and enter his assistant, Walter Smith. Smith brought in Archie Knox from their Dundee United days and in their first season together, the duo won the club's fourth championship trophy. Building on the team's appetite for success, the club went on to take the title over the next three seasons as well. After seven straight title wins, a footballing record set 20 years earlier, one that had seemed impossible to equal, was on the lips of the Ibrox faithful. Oh, it was always there. It was always there, I think. Um... After six or seven, then suddenly there's only two more to go or one more to go or three more to go. Yeah, it was there. And it was only then you're saying to yourself, this is getting closer and closer and people started to realise, the supporters started to realise that this is getting closer all the time and, and can we actually equal that record? What was that record? It was a world footballing first. Nine championships in a row chopped up by their oldest and deadliest rivals, Celtic. It had stood for 23 years and had looked untouchable. I didn't know of the uh, of the nine in a row for Celtic back in the, I think it was in the 60s, uh, but um, I was certainly told that by most Scottish players when I joined the club, that that was the goal. I, I couldn't see it happening again after Celtic did it, that achievement. And it nearly didn't. In the eighth season, Rangers won in a photo finish. Celtic tried to stop us, uh, you know, getting near the target of the nine, but running us very close in the uh, the eighth, winning the eighth championship. I think Celtic only lost the one game that season, which is remarkable when you go through a season only lose one game and you still don't win the championship. But nine was the magic number, the lottery win, the code to the safe. Even the massive achievement of eight in a row would have been rendered meaningless if the ninth was not to adorn the Ibrox trophy room. I think it would have been for a lot of the players like that they had failed. That was my impression. It's strange to say that because uh, but winning eight titles on, on the trot is absolutely fantastic. The pressure came in the territory. Um, you know, because I don't care what anybody said, um, the eight would have been forgotten. Had we not equaled it, 
we'd have been known as a team that never managed to equal it. Uh, no matter the eight you go before. And Celtic were hardly going to roll over. Nine was as cherished a numeral in the East End as it had become in the south side of Glasgow. But with some of the team looking ready to be put out to grass, could Rangers produce the goods one more time? Oh, I don't think you can be totally confident that you're, you're going to do it. But we were confident enough in that group of players that at least they're going to give it the best goal uh, ever. You know, they'd, they'd been to the well quite a few times, these players, and you were asking them to go one more time, if you like. And uh, we had, as everybody knows, a fairly ageing squad uh, at that particular time. It might have been an ageing squad, but it did have a secret weapon. Gaza. A genius on the field and as mad as a plum in a pear tree full of figs off it. Uh, obviously the obvious one's about the fish in Gordon Jury's car. It wasn't the fact that he put the fish in the car, it was where he put them. Ah, <laughs> a fish story. Gaza was, Gaza was unique. One under the wheel, spare wheel, which is an obvious place. But he'd actually unscrewed the panel of the door and put one in there. And I'm thinking, oh, what did I not think of that for? That's just brilliant criminal mind. So... <laughs> we're all rolling about laughing so eventually he sends it in to get cleaned they find the fish underneath the spare tyre back it comes they've not found the second fish so he comes in two days later and the smell's just outrageous you've no idea he said I'm not t uh, lads I swear to God he said I'm struggling to stop at traffic lights people are walking by and I'm stuck at traffic lights and they're going jeez right so we went to training the following day and do you know those wee Christmas tree things we air fresheners, he had about 37 of them hanging up in his car, he had yellow ones, green ones, blue ones, red ones, you near the scent, they were hanging up, so we were in tears laughing and tears laughing. Eventually they send it back into the cleaners, eh, the, the car company, who, who found the second fish, but this time it was just like some corky the cat had got to, it was just like a wee skeleton, you know, but the smell was outrageous, but that was gas coin, you know, never a dull moment, it was magic. You know that when he was on the football pitch and that, he was... He, he was obviously looked such a confident character. But until that team was named, that was him. The tie would come off, the jacket would be come down there, the trousers would come down, in the middle of Walter's team talk. And I think Walter said, are you going to listen to what we're saying here, Gascoigne? But that was him starting to tune in. You only have such players like, I don't know, every 50, 60, 70 years, I don't know, maybe every 100 years. And he made trouble. Of course, that, that cost the club a lot of trouble as well. But you need to have these kind of players to be successful. Rangers came flying out of the blocks at the start of the season, winning their first six games. The assault on Celtic's cherished place in the history of Scottish football was well underway. At the start of the season, I didn't think Celtic had a hope in hell of getting anywhere near us. I thought with the squad we had, even though it was an ageing squad, that... Um, the momentum that we'd built up, 7-8, I thought we would have obviously walked away with nine. At that time, there was only Celtic that was going to beat us. There was nobody else going to come and challenge us. I just think they, get, they were paranoid against us. They, were paranoid, they, they didn't know how to beat us. And so, to the first Old Firm game of the season. There was no stopping Rangers. It was as if they could smell the title. Presumably Chanel number nine. Sorry, bad, bad joke. They beat Celtic 2-0. Everything in the garden was rosy. Except when they turned their thoughts to Europe, Rangers were blooming awful. In the media, everything was about nine in a row. I mean, forget about the European campaign, but if we, if we, if we got that title, that would be worth anything. The ninth season was the priority. If we, if we'd have lost that season, then you, you just couldn't imagine people. You couldn't imagine losing it for the fans, for us, for the manager, for the chairman. It'd be that would have been heartbreaking. Personally, as a professional footballer, I must say I'd rather won the Champions League, which everybody would have been happy as well. But for, if you ask me personally, what I felt for my support for the Rangers support, I'd rather had the ninth championship in a row. Europe, fantastic. We'd all, all love to do it at any other season than um, the ninth. No. That's the only regret I had, uh, well, I have in my Rangers career, that we didn't really, you know, put our mark in on international level. We had disappointments in European games during that period, but they recovered from that very well. 
and never let it affect them too much. And I think that showed more than anything else the mentality that they had, the, the kind of strength of character they had to handle um, what sometimes were big disappointments and not let it affect them. Rangers had built up that winning mentality and strength of character over eight seasons. They also had other qualities in spadefuls. A massive desire to win. That's all we wanted to do, win. You could have taken the bonus money off us, it didn't matter, as long as we won. The team used to, you know, it was like a big sponge, used to feed off each other. We used to feed off each other, the winning mentality, the attitude and the will to win. A lot of good players um, crumble sometimes when they get into the, 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 the tough games. But if, if you have that mental toughness, which we certainly had a lot of in, in our team, um, then you can go all the way. But by the time the second Old Firm clash had come around in November, the Celtic Challenge had gathered steam. 11 games into the season and with 26 points apiece, Celtic shimmied ahead in goal difference. The stakes had just been upped. We knew this game can turn things around, definitely. I mean, if we lose this game, then we'll be trailing Celtic and they will have the other hand. And uh, so psychologically, that game, I think, was the most important. Too right it was, and the match was scheduled for Celtic Park, Fortress Parkhead. But we're never going to outplay Celtic at Parkhead, we all knew that, so um, it's a hard place to go. And as long as we were organised against them and we could defend, and our keeper was capable of making the odd save or two, we knew that we'd get a chance, and we knew, we always believed we would score. The amount of times we came away from Parkhead winning 1-0 after getting a doing was uh, ridiculous. There's a slip by O'Neill and loud up to win. Rangers look for a goal and get one in the eighth minute from Brian Loudrup. And such self-belief was the difference between the two sides. Rangers won 1-0. With two wins in the bag over Celtic and victories against Aberdeen, Dunfermline and Hearts, Rangers built up an 11-point lead by Christmas. So plenty of room for a wee celebration then. Except they didn't count on a grey-haired man in a waistcoat. Walter Smith, the gaffer. What did Walter do? Walter Smith cancelled Christmas. Managers have got that power. I can cancel Christmas. Not within my own household, but Christmas parties were cancelled that year. We were livid because the whole thing was arranged and all the boys were looking forward to it. They cancelled it and that was it. And once you cancelled it, there was no no appeal, no case for the defence, there was nothing. That was it. We just had to go on with our work. It at least gave me a night's sleep that I normally lost when I knew it was a, it was a Christmas day out. But I'll tell you something, and what he doesn't know, what a Christmas day we had out in January. <laughs> Despite suggestions that Rangers team spirit came in bottles, there was no doubting their incredible camaraderie and thirst for titles. The team we drank together, once together, which was a famous one that got sort of um, placed in the camp. We certainly had good times. We certainly went out for lunch that lasted three days. Well documented. But then on the Saturday we'd come out and win 3 4 nil and play really well. I think it's a fallacy been built up and a dream been built up that our team were out having lunchtime sessions, going for lunch and, and having a few beers and a glass of wine three, four days a week. That's, I've never heard so much nonsense in all my life. They took me into a pub and everybody was drinking a beer and that was new for me because I'm a professional football player. I don't drink, but to that time I, I smoked already. So I thought, well, if they drink, I can smoke, no problem. And it was, you could see, they didn't believe that I was smoking. They said, well, you're a professional football player, how can you smoke? And I just said, well, how can you drink? But I, I realised early on in my Rangers career that I, I just couldn't do it because uh, if I had to perform well in the park, then uh, I really I had to pick out the, you know, um, the lunches and uh, I couldn't uh, join the players every, every week, that, that's for sure. It was, it was too tough on my, on my body, really. Days out really steam from the pressure cooker of their chase for the ninth and wind-ups were the chosen pastime. Everyone was fair game, including the kit man, affectionately known as Doddy. We used to go up to St Andrews and the bill had probably come to eight, nine, ten, eleven thousand pounds for eight of us for a weekend. But I um, remember one, it was a Tuesday morning, we came back in training. And old Doddy, God bless him, old Doddy, he was up with us. And the gaffer got the list with all the, the room bills, the room charges. So, Jack McCoist, uh -huh. Gorham, £84.50. Durant McCoist, £1.20. Jukebox, £85.60. Doddy, £3,955. The boys have been putting everything on Doddy's bill. 
Old Doddy nearly collapsed, I swear my life is face with a picture. And the gaffer just looked and said, you can pay a pound a week, OK? Walter Smith, the gaffer, instinctively understood what it was that made his team tick. With his assistant, Archie Knox, they formed a winning partnership. We always had Archie, who was the, the disciplinarian, um, who was always the shouting, swearing and getting in your face. And Walter always, always seemed to take a back seat and let Archie go on with it. But when Walter did have something to say, um, everyone, everyone sat up and took notice. He knows his players. He knows exactly how he can treat some players. One of the players he needs to shout at, the other player you just need to say, well, you're a good player, just to tell him he's a good player, then he performs well, and Walter knew that. The secret at Ibrox was that everybody wanted to play for Walter, and if we, if we got beat, or if we didn't play well, then we'd let him down. It's not letting the club or the fans down, we'd let the father down. At the turn of the year, the Rangers' juggernaut seemed unstoppable. They nursed an 11-point lead over their only genuine challenger, Celtic. It seemed only a plague could stop them from powering to the title. And talking of plagues, you'll never guess. Well, we had a load of, a load of people uh, um, had gone down with the flu or that, that virus, and um, it was a case that had got so bad that would, the doctor had said, right, there's no way that any of these players are going to be able to play. It did become a big worry, but um, especially something like that, because you, you can accept and you, you appreciate and you realise you're going to get injuries and, you know, one or two injuries, one or two suspensions, but if you get something like that that comes along that can wipe out seven or eight, nine, ten players, it does become a little bit of a concern. But do you know something, honest? The overriding factor was the boys who went out there were you know, suffer from hypothermia, never mind flu. But that was another indication of the sort of drive and the determination that these players had to say, right, everybody's everybody's sort of acting against us, everybody's sort of uh, trying to stop us winning this nine in a row. We've got to just produce a little bit extra here. And not a team for making a drama out of a crisis, a couple of paracetamol were all that was required. In the New Year derby, Rangers went on to win 3-1, just what the doctor had ordered. The hero of the hour, the other Dane, Eric Bo Anderson. With a commanding 14-point lead, the ninth title looked secure. The fans thought it, the press thought it. Even I thought it, and I wasn't there. Players do read newspapers um, and listen to fans, and it's, it, it then becomes difficult because you do create another monster. And I don't care what MD says, you, you don't know what goes on in people's heads. You know, you look at the league table and you think 14 points clear. You maybe do take your foot off the gas. You think that's the work, the work done, when in fact it's not. Never a truer word spoken. Rangers started dropping points with draws against Kilmarnock, Hearts and Aberdeen and they lost at home to Dundee United. By the time the crucial confrontation with Celtic came around, there were just five fragile points between them. Sometimes pressure can be too much and uh, at some point I felt um, halfway through the season that, um, I mean, I, th I think we were maybe a little too motivated in some games, you know, because we really wanted to deliver. And uh, sometimes motivation is a good thing, but to be too motivated is, is a bad thing. There was things thrown, there was cups going flying across here and there. Um, that's obviously because the pressure was beginning to build. We were fighting at training every day over the five or eight games. Uh, and I mean, fish takeoffs and then that would be it finished. We got on with a cup of tea and we train the next day. You see people... Uh complaining about spats on training pitches and that, then we had more than our fair share of that. But that was just an edge to to the training that, uh, you know, resulted in players maybe falling out of each other, a bad tackle or or whatever. But it just it just emphasised the the edge there was in everything they did. I've, I've belted players at half-time. We have fights in training. That's because we care. And uh, well, it was no different. Archie Knox and Coyce had a few scuffles in the dressing room because they care. If you go through a season or nine seasons with that pressure under, if you don't end up having an argument or having a, a wee scuffle now and then, then there's something wrong because that, that, that's what, I think that's what keeps you going. You're on the edge all the time. By March, Rangers were flirting with disaster as they prepared for back-to-back -back Celtic Park showdowns, including the match that would surely decide the championship. But before that, the quarter-final of the Scottish Cup. And there was another plague this time of injuries. And worst of all, Rangers talisman Paul Gascoigne had picked up an ankle knock and still had the same tailor. 
all needs to be playing. Everyone needs to be playing, but more so, um, Paul. Paul needed to play uh, to keep yourself sane, to keep yourself obviously away from the off-field um, distraction. And Paul just gets bored, bored very, very easily. And when Paul gets bored, well, Paul gets distracted. With time on his hands, Gaza went on a week-long bender with his showbiz pals. I think the collective noun might be bevy. Celtic were desperate for victory. They had lost all three meetings with their oldest rivals that season and the Scottish Cup was a chance for revenge. That day, Celtic did their customary huddle before and after the game. The huddle. The huddle. Um, didn't enjoy that. It's one of them things that's... Uh, it's OK celebrating. So we celebrated at Parkhead when we won, but we did it off the pitch. And when they did that, that was kind of taking the piss a wee bit. And I thought that showed a little bit of disrespect to, to, to everybody at Rangers. But I know that sometimes in old final games there can be um, circumstances where you get carried away. Celtic had lost the previous three league games, so therefore, you know, that, that happened. But it did give me an opportunity to, to use that as a, a kind of motivational tool. There was no way we could have, we could have handled that again. We just didn't want that to happen. And, um, you know, in a bizarre way, as crazy as it might sound, you know, and especially in the league campaign, it might have been the best thing that happened to us. Suddenly, the tide had turned. The showdown at Celtic Park in ten days' time threatened to wash away Rangers' nine-in-a-row dream. Victory for Celtic would close the gap to a wafer-thin two points and leave the hoops with all the momentum. Out was McCoist. Out was Gascoigne. Out was Gorham. And Richard Goff was looking doubtful. But the ever wily Smith had a plan to bring back a Rangers legend. Who? A man they called Attila. No way. Mark Haley. Mark Haley? It's not coming back, it's just coming home. That's how I feel. You know, I mean, the body went, but the, the heart and the spirit stayed here, I think. I couldn't believe I, I had the opportunity to go back to a, a football club that I loved. Yep, Mark Haley had come back for one last time to do what he did best. Score goals against Celtic. Haightley had signed for Rangers in 1990, winning five titles with them before leaving in 1995 to go to QPR. Who would have thought of bringing, you know, a 35, 36-year-old, uh, you know, centre forward back to your club to get a result? Uh, it was, it's, you know, it's a psychological thing. It was a genius move because after the gap was closing so much, the gaffer had to do something special. And that was a perfect idea to bring Mark Haightley back. He took the pressure a little bit away and he lifted the spirit again. He's such a kind of player, such kind of person who can lift everybody up. Mark Haightley's return had the players and the fans choking on their cornflakes. But what about a replacement for Gorham? Walter and Archie reach for the bumper catalogue of goalkeepers for hire. So we're going through books and racking our brain and, and I come up with the name of Andy Dibble. From Manchester City, I think Manchester City reserves, and maybe not even getting a game for Manchester City reserves. And Walter's reaction? You sure Andy Dibble can do the job for us? I said, well, I've not seen Andy Dibble for for ages, for years. Um, you know, it would be a it would be a shot in the dark. Uh, first day's training, I'm batting these balls into him. I thought it was Officer Dibble would sign, by the way, right? Honestly, God, those boys flying the back of the net, top corner, dropping him here. I thought to myself, what have we got going here? So this was it. The accumulation of nine gruelling seasons had come to this. One match against Celtic. Ninety heart-stopping minutes. Win, and their place in history was all but assured. Nervous? That was the most nervous that uh, I'd certainly felt. But, you know, the heart was pumping, the mind was racing, uh, blood pressure was up. The closer we got to it, the, the more we could taste the blood. It was about going out and, and muscle, you know, and, and use our strength. It was incredible. I mean, your hairs are standing up and, and it's just beautiful to walk on, onto the park. And I just couldn't wait. Rangers had won. The job was all but done. They had secured an eight-point lead with just six games to go. But if the title race was all but over, the controversy 
had just begun. Rangers wanted revenge for that huddle by doing one of their own. It was a red rag to a green bull. Well, I don't know who was to, to blame for that or who instigated that, but, uh, well, I know exactly who it was, but I can never I can never reveal who, who it, it was. It was actually me and Ian Ferguson that had planned the thing. For the next game, if we got a result, we'd do the huddle. But the plan was to do the conga coming off the pitch, after the huddle. But if they'd have done the conga, dear, 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 that would have, have topped it all. There were a few stuttering moments at the end, but five games later, Rangers fans kept their date with destiny at Tannadice. There was a great determination in the dressing room that, you know, here's you're standing on the brink of history here, and every one of you will be part of that history. And history it might have been, but for some of the players, the goal which clinched it was more hysterical than historical. Tell you freakish it was. Charlie Muller's left foot crossed the ball in Brian Lowdrop's head, finished it off. Now, it was bad enough seeing Charlie out in the left wing, crossing the ball with his left foot, but you see Loudrop attempting to get his hair in a mess. I just, that's my lasting memory, nine in a row. I think I've scored uh, two or three goals uh, throughout my whole, you know, 15-year-old career with a head, so obviously uh, it was just meant to be, I think, and, uh, and it was fantastic. <laughs> Rangers hadn't just won a title, they had exorcised a ghost. They had equalled Celtic's remarkable nine-in-a-row run. It really was just genuine, <sighs> more than anything. You could just see the relief, and I'm sure Walter got about five or ten years knocked off his looks there. He went from the old man to the young man. Well, I don't know, I don't even, happiness didn't come into it at that stage. It really, it really didn't come into it at that stage, it was just like... Phew. Somebody moving something off your shoulder, somebody taking a weight off your back. After winning that title, it was just like, you know, we we had done it for our fans, for the club, for ourselves, obviously, and and we knew that uh, now that the ha the fans would be happy about that, you know, achieving that record, something that will never happen again. The, the special, special. I could sit here for three weeks and try to explain to you. It's a difficult thing to explain, and uh, the bunch of boys that I played with certainly loved it, loved every second of it. The battle was over. So, let the party begin. 6,000 fans formed a welcome committee when the team arrived back at Agbrox at one o'clock in the morning. They'd smelt this. They had it in their nostrils from the end of the, the eighth season that uh, this was to be the big one and that they were going to, the, the, nothing was going to stop them. I mean, it was a monkey on our back, but it was a monkey that you could never avoid. Um, and put it this way, it was a great monkey on our back because if we didn't have the monkey on the back, we wouldn't have been going for it. I don't think it'll ever be done again. You can never say that, but in, in, as I say, in modern times, I don't think it'll ever be done again, and uh, uh, what a way to do it. Football's different now. They're so professional and so... I'm actually glad I'm not playing now, because I, I couldn't have handled it that way, sparkling water and pasta. I'm glad I played in the 90s when we had a, a, a laugh and a carry on and a drink and won. But um, Koisha always said to us, his goal, he said, we've got all the medals we want, we've got all the shots we want, we used to swap shots all the time. We got all the shirts, all the medals we want. You see, but the one thing they can't take the memories away. And he's, he's right, they can't. And I turned around and I said, Of course, you are right. The one thing is, we can't remember half of them. 